faced with the most extreme of circumstances, a life and death situation, you would expect a great deal of worry and anxiety or fear or stress or something. And we get, would it help? It's part of our DNA. It's a part of our, uh, of being a human being, uh, our nature, isn't it? To be afraid when our lives are in danger or to be worried or in some way fearful or stressful over certain things that don't go our way or possibly things that, that, uh, that frighten us. Yet a man stands with full resolve knowing that things will be what they will be and there is nothing, nothing he can change by worrying or fretting over the circumstances. Rational, irrational fears aside, uh, they are a hot topic for modern psychologists today and, and uh, a hinge pin, a boom for the uh, pharmaceutical agencies that are out there today as they are trying to promise and to stand in the gap to you, standing ready to fix all of your problems. How many of you would like a pill today that would fix all of your problems? Would you go ahead and raise your hand today? Good. It's okay to raise your hands in church. In this, in this regard, all right? We take a pill today that says, in order to get rid of all the things that are troubling me, I would, uh, I would do that. Now, what they're doing is they're capitalizing on the fickleness and the fears of this fragile human psyche of ours because they promise to heal, but they cannot. They promise to come alongside and provide, but they cannot. What they can do is paint a very frightening picture with their ill-informed diagnosis and their <laughs> futile speculations on how they can fix all of our problems. Would it help? Would it help to be worried about something? Let's go ahead and just take a, a minute, maybe about 60 seconds, and uh, let's just go ahead and get it all out there. The things that we're worried about, the things that we're fearful over. Uh, I'm going to give you... 10 seconds to think about it and then at, at one time we're just going to all just say it out loud and then uh, we're going to just go ahead and get that out there on the, on the surface today. Okay, I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think starting now. Okay, ready? Three, two, one. There we go. I don't think anybody mentioned lying. Probably some of you mentioned lying maybe in there somewhere that, uh, that you didn't want to uh, say anything. But we're all confronted with this. No one stands before you today in perfect contentment. Says, I never worry about anything. I never struggle over anything emotionally or spiritually or physically. It is a matter of fact that in our human nature we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle over the things that we don't know. We're going to struggle over the things that are around the corner that we can't see, that we can't foresee. And so we're going to be concerned about that. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. In preparation for the sermon this week, I, was, I picked up a booklet that uh, we often counsel with here uh, at Faith Church in our biblical counseling ministry called Anger, Anxiety, and Fear. Uh, I've got, I think, maybe one left in the resource area out there. Uh, we've got some, some left next door in the office. But in the, the, the author, Stuart Scott, writes this in the booklet from the very beginning. He says, from the time we were young children, we were told to be brave and to show no fear. This was especially true for boys, and yet we live in a society where anxiety and fear are rampant. Even though we as Christians should not and need not worry, we still find reasons to be anxious and fearful. Many people experience more worry than they care to admit, living in a state of anxiety and rarely having a sense of peace. Some have trouble sleeping at night and trying to manage their worries and fears with medication. Still others suffer from debilitating panic attacks or even worse, nervous breakdowns. What a picture, huh? A picture of the reality of our day and the struggles that we face. What I want to talk to you about today, today's battle topic is really going to be a continuation for a sermon that I preached back in September called The Gift Versus the Giver. And how our pursuit is usually for the gift, for the healing, for the provision, for the protection. And in all actuality, we miss out on 
looking to the giver, the provider, the protector, the healer. And so when we take our eyes, we take our focus off of that, we, we're going to find ourselves in a, a bit of trouble. And that's what I want to talk about today. We were in Luke chapter 12 then, and even though your notes say Matthew chapter 6 at the top, it was because I had used some of that in that last sermon, and I forgot to change it in your sermon notes today. So if you've already found Matthew chapter 6, you're in the wrong spot. But Luke chapter 12 is where we're going to go. I'm just going to read through that parable again on the rich fool, and then we're going to pick up where Jesus picked up uh, in the application of that. So if you'll find your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 12, the third gospel of the New Testament there. Luke chapter 12, we're going to begin in verse 16, and I'm going to ask you to stand with me, if you would, in honor of reading God's Word aloud together. Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21 is where we'll be. So Jesus told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool! This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Lord, that is a sobering story today in your word. Lord, how we need this message today. There's not one person in this room that is exempt from fear or the worry, or the cares, or the concerns of this life. So may your word today be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. May it bring wisdom and understanding. Give us a wise and discerning heart today to hear the truth, to receive the truth, to apply the truth to our lives. Thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We see the man in the parable called the fool. He's a fool for a reason. He's amassed a great fortune. He's got quite a bit of wealth. He's got quite a bit of land. He's got quite a harvest of crops going on here. Everything seems to be going very, very, very well. He's a very successful man. That's not what makes him a fool. What makes him a fool is the fact that in verse 19 he says to himself and convinces himself, I've got plenty of money, I've got plenty of time, so now it's just a time to take it easy and just let life come on by. Eat, drink, and be merry. It sounds like a great plan until verse 20 when God says to him, you fool, your time's up and you can't take anything with you. You're departing from this life. Your soul is required of you. You've been concerning yourself with all of the wrong things. You were looking to fortune, and here is fortune. And now on the day that your soul is required of you, what good will that fortune do for you? For us today, it would be, man, I finally aspired to get that job and, and that level and that status in life. And now your soul is required of you. And what good will that do you? That car that you're driving, that house that you're living in, that neighborhood that you're in, that girl that you've met, that relationship that you're in, whatever it may be. You finally aspire to the thing that you've been hoping for and to gain in your life. And now that your soul is required of you, what good is it now? You see, he says, you fool. Your soul is at stake. Eternity is at stake. You've been concerning yourself with all of the wrong things. And, and, and as we hear this parable, not only is it a very sobering story, but Jesus doesn't end there. He picks it right up and he begins to, to talk more practically to them in, in application for what he is about to say. And, and so as we look at this, we want to continue on in the story that Jesus is going to say that there's a more desirable pursuit out there than worldly gain or worldly pleasures or even the base necessities of life that we think we can't live without. We're going to talk about food. We're going to talk about clothing. Other texts will talk about shelter. Other places will talk about the things and the cares and the concerns of this life. Jesus moves on and he warns us against 
worldly greed and shows us how to live and how to win in this daily battle and this struggle of worry versus contentment, which is our battleground today. Look at verse 22 and we'll pick it up from there. Jesus says to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have no storeroom nor barn, and yet God feeds them. And please take note of this today. How much more valuable you are than the birds. If you'd like to write in your Bible, star that or circle that, especially that word valuable. How much more treasured, how much more valuable you are than the birds. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life span? You see the futility of that. If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God... So clothes the grass in the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace. <clears throat> How much more will he clothe you, you men of little faith? And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink and do not keep worrying. For all these nations of the world eagerly seek these things. But your father knows that you need these things. Simple advice, right? Easy to preach, hard to live. Do not worry. Simple. Makes me think of that old Bobby McFerrin song way back in the 80s. For those of you in my generation, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Be happy. Do -do 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 -do. Yeah. You remember that. And it puts a smile on your face to think about things like that. It seems so simplistic and so easy. But when the command comes not to worry, what in the world is Jesus talking about? Doesn't He know what's going on? Doesn't He see our affliction? Doesn't He know our struggle? Doesn't he? Of course He does. We are told in, in, in repeated fashion, and especially in the book of Hebrews, that Jesus is a great high priest who sympathizes with our weakness. He is your creator. He knows every single thing about you. So what are you saying here? Do not worry. So let's define some terms a little bit and then we're going to get back into our text. All right. So worry, according to Siri on my phone, means this, to give way to anxiety or unease. In your sermon notes today, go ahead and write this in your blank today, to give way to anxiety or unease. It's the allowing of one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. Now, both of those come from two different sources, but I think they add a lot to each other. And giving way to anxiety and unease is to say that something's not right in my world. If something is not quite what I expected, or there's something that I'm anticipating that I'm not quite sure of, and, and that's kind of what, what I focus on and the things that I would worry about. It's not so much as the here and now sometimes, it's the things that I can't see, the things that I can't control, the things that are tomorrow, the things that are around the corner, the things that are too high for me to reach on the shelf. No short jokes inputted there, but things that I, I just can't quite attain and I don't understand. In verse 22, he just simply says, do not worry about your life. Stop being anxious, your translation may say. If you've got the King James, it says, take no thought. Have no thought. Contentment means, and we'll, we'll come back to this in a minute, contentment means a state of personal happiness or satisfaction. To, to, to really lay the, the, the foundation of the battleground today, we need to see both of these. The worry is something's not right. The contentment is, man, things are right, and I am content, I am happy, I am fulfilled in them. Sometimes a way to better explain a word is to describe its opposite. And so I would say today that worry is the lack of contentment. It's the state, uh, really, of an unholy dissatisfaction with our current standing or our future outlook or what may be around the corner. Worry is the lack of contentment. Essentially, the worry would be the enemy of contentment. Because how can you be content when you are worried or afraid about what's coming next? I don't necessarily understand all of that. I do know for certain 
that I have it, that others have it. We're going to struggle with it over and over and over again. So where does worry come from? Where does worry come from? I want to give you some quick bullets on this today in our text. First, worry comes from a lack of perspective. A lack of perspective. And you can ask yourself the question here, what is most important? What is most valuable? In verse 22, it says, do not worry about your life. In verse 23, life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. In verse 24, uh, it says that how much more valuable you are than the birds. So you see, what happens is we've got diet and fashion going on. It's important to them then. It's important to us today. But diet and fashion aren't everything. Food and clothing aren't everything. God sees these things. God knows what you need. We need not worry about them or fret over them or be, be frustrated or fearful over them. You see, what happens for us is we place so many things on our I can't live without list. Right? We all have it. We all have it. We could make a list today, the things that I just absolutely can't live without. And, and before you know it, man, you, you're going to have some things on there that aren't really needs or I can't live without. So they're going to be just personal things that you've grown accustomed to, things that you think you have to have in order to live. The problem with that is, is that most of us end up evaluating God's love and care for us based on whether He gives us the stuff on that list or not. Here's my, I cannot live without list. Now God, it's up to you to bring all that about. And when He doesn't, we worry. When we don't get it, we become fearful. So there's a lack of perspective. Second is a lack of vision. A lack of vision which can ask the question, what does really worry accomplish? This is the question on the video. Would it help? Would it help? Have I so lost sight? The hymn writer says, the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His, what? Glory and grace. So just imagine that you've taken your eyes off of glory and grace and you put your eyes on your job status, your relationship, your grocery bill, your utility bills. We tend to, to lose sight of this in, in verse 25, and which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his lifespan? You see the futility in that. If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? We lose our perspective when we take our eyes off the author and finisher of our faith. We, we, we lose our perspective when we lose vision, when we take our eyes off the prize and our eyes off the goal and we begin to focus on everything. Peter, saw, Peter had this very thing when he's walking on the water. He's got his eyes on Jesus, right? And he's walking towards him, walking towards him. And then he saw the storm and he worried and he became fearful for his life. And he took his eyes off of Jesus and he began to sink. Man, that happens to us, doesn't it? You come home after that doctor's appointment. You come home after the, the boss has said well, he's going to be laying people off. He's come home and you haven't talked to your spouse in three, four days. You come home and everything's a wreck and everything's a mess. It's all those things that make us want to take our eyes off where they should be. And they focus in, they hone in really on the things that are so temporal. Third, worry comes from a lack of faith. From a lack of faith in verse 28, If God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow thrown in the furnace, how much more will He clothe you, you men of little faith? Worry is a failure of faith. Worry is a failure of trust. It's the evidence of unbelief. And what happens is when we take our eyes off of Him, we forget about Him. One of the interesting things when we, when we went through the Ten Commandments back in our Exodus study, we saw a portion of that, and it, re it repeats again in Deuteronomy. Here's all of the commandments of the Lord. Here's what you're supposed to do. Here's how you're supposed to live. Here's how you're supposed to, to follow, how you treat me, how you treat each other. But he said, be careful and do them lest you forget. You're going to get into a land which you, did not, which you do not own. You're going to have uh, graves and, and, and cisterns and, and, and wells and, and things like that that you're going to dig. And that none of these things are your own. I'm providing them everything. And you're going to forget. Life is going to get so easy, you're going to forget about me. And then life is going to get so much more difficult, and you will forget about me. Plenty of us, plenty of us could pass the, the God is sovereign test today. 
We would not have a problem standing in a church service and going, God, you are sovereign. You are transcendent above all. You are holy. You are righteous. You are just. You are the creator king, right? You, you, you made the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they show up exactly when they need to show up. You made the oceans to come in so far and to come right back out because that's how far you told them to go. And by the way, he knows all those stars by name. The earth rotates on its axis and it orbits around the sun day after day after day. It keeps through doing these things and repeating these things because God made it so. God is sovereign. <laughs> Except for this little financial situation I've got and I'm going to have to run down to the cash place and just hawk something. God is sovereign. He knows the sun, the moon, and the stars, but this relationship problem that I'm having, man, he, 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 no, he can't handle that part. Plenty of us can pass the God is sovereign test, but not many of us will pass the test where is God sovereign in my daily personal affairs. We take our eyes off. We look around at all the other things. We focus in on our circumstances and we become worried and fearful. Fourthly, in your bullet here, worry comes or worry demonstrates a lack of distinction. It demonstrates a lack of distinction. We saw that in verse 30. All these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. The things that we concern ourselves with, the, the, the Gentiles, the pagans, the unbelievers, they're looking for all that stuff. They're worried about all those kinds of things. Why? Because the temporal, the right here and now, is the only thing that they've got. For us as believers to know that, that our God has gone ahead of us to prepare a place for us and that we can sing a song in a church service like this, this is not my home yet. I'm going someplace else. Far better than this land. Far better than this life. I have something to look forward to, a hope to cling to. The pagans of the world, the Gentiles of the world, the nations of the world eagerly seek these things and they're worried about these things and they will go on and on and on and on and on trying to have all their problems taken care of, but it won't work. Once again, I'll refer you back to Stuart Scott's book, Anger, Anxiety, and Fear. And he, he mentions that there's two types uh, of this here. There is a legit godly concern. And I want to talk to you about that. There's a godly concern. There's an ungodly worry and fear. Write these things down today as far as defining godly concern. This is the caring about important things for the right reasons. Now, who gets to define important things is going to be compared to what in the next bullet is accompanied by trust in God's ultimate control. What are the things that you trust God for? Are you willing to trust God in your finances? Are you willing to trust God in your daily allotment of food and clothing and shelter and so on and so on? Those base needs in our life. Or have you gotten so out of whack and so off focus that, man, you don't know who to turn to anymore? It's pressing in on you. It's threatening to overwhelm you. Now, now, get this in mind. There is a legit, godly concern about things in our life. And the scripture passage today, nor the battle topic that we grapple with today, gives any implication that we're ever to just idly sit by and let go and let God. We don't, that's not what the scripture is talking about here. We should work hard for our daily supply. There should be working. There should be mindfulness in this regard. We should not rest idle and lazily expect things to just happen for us. The Christian life and the scriptures never encourage this. But hear this for certain today, that contentment never breeds complacency. To be content in the Lord doesn't mean that you can sit back like the rich fool and just sit back and go, well, okay, everything's now good now. I punched my ticket into heaven. I don't need to do anything anymore. Contentment never breeds complacency. We should be shrewd. We should be smart. We should be sober-minded in and toward the world. We work for things. We labor, we toil, we spend, we, we talk about things, we, we're mindful of things, and that's the, the next part. There are things that we should concern ourselves with. No one's in here today to say, no, you shouldn't be concerned about locking your door at night and protecting your family. You shouldn't be concerned about going and working and providing so you can provide food for your family. There are things that are automatics. But then there's a big difference, you see, between being mindful over something and being so consumed by it that you can't hardly breathe. That's 
where the ungodly worry and anxiety comes in because it goes beyond reasonable concern. It goes beyond just the mindful and it becomes consumed. It involves worry about the mere possibilities. All right. So fill this in your blank under ungodly worry and anxiety. Right. It goes beyond reasonable concern and it involves worry about just the possibility. The focus is not on God or what is true and helpful. It's I am so fearful of what could be. And let me tell you, I've been in the church all my life. And man, one of the most disappointing things that I have seen in all of my days and all of my ministry in the church is for God's people to come together. Professing Christians to come together, believers to come together, to say this is what we've discerned from God and His Word and through His people, that this is the direction that He wants us to go, this is the thing that He wants us to do, the ministry or the task that He wants us to accomplish. And so we get ourselves into a room, we say yes, this is it, this is God's will, this is God's direction, and then we start talking amongst ourselves. But if we make this decision, we need to be mindful we need to be mindful that if we make this decision, we go in this direction, we're probably going to lose people. We're probably going to lose people. And you know who's going to leave first? It's going to be so-and-so. And so-and-so is going to affect so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And you know they're the big money givers in the church. And we begin to compromise what God's direction and will is for the life of the church because we're concerned that unspiritual people are going to get their feelings hurt and they're going to leave and take their money with them and God is no longer sovereign over the church. And we worry in the midst of God's people, in God's house, in the middle of God's will, wondering where do we go from here? It just sounds so silly, doesn't it? Except the fact that probably right now you're already painfully looking in a painful mirror. The problem is that it paralyzes, it can paralyze the believer into inaction. We become so worried about tomorrow that we can't exist today. There's no glory and grace today that we're living in. We lose sight of hope. We lose sight of faith. We lose sight of Christ. We lose sight of the direction and the, the abilities that He has given us and the tasks that He's given us to, to work and to serve. And, and it's compromised because we're worried about what might happen tomorrow. It's fickle. It's fearful. And it's quite a roller coaster ride that we will find ourselves on. Corey Ten Boom said this worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, it empties today of its strength. I'll quote from Scott again. He says, God wants us to live in reality, but at the same time, He wants us to bring Him, Christ, into the picture. And let me just say this right here a reality without Christ in the picture is just wrong living. Okay? Any reality, any real picture that you have of this life, if it doesn't involve Christ, then it's going to be completely focused inward on your own self and your own circumstances. And man, that's just a disappointing way to live. Paul David Tripp wrote this in my devotional this week. He says, you can't live to meet all your needs and just live to serve Christ at the same time. Live as his disciple, he implores. He's got your true needs covered. And I look at this text, and I think, man, it's just, the advice seems simple, but so deep and so profound. It, the, the counsel from the Lord just seems to be so simplistic. Just do this, and you're going to be okay. But Lord, I say, but Lord, I say, don't you, don't you know? Don't you see? Don't you understand? You, you got to have, you got to give me some grace here. You got to give me some slack here because, man, this is a difficult thing. This is a tough spot. He says, stop worrying. What good is that going to do you? You're not in control. You never were and you never will be. But the one who is will lovingly supply your every need according to his riches and glory. He will do it. Essentially, Jesus is saying in this passage, I do see you and I do know you. I know what's around you. I know what's behind you. I know what's in front of you. I know that monster in the closet that you're afraid of. 
I know the boogeyman in the dark that you are so fearful of and you're worried about. I know that the enemy of the age is roaring and roaming like a, like a lion seeking whom he may devour. I know him and he's no trouble for me. I know you're hungry. I know you're lonely. I know you're despairing. I know you're afraid. I know you're heartbroken. I know your spirit is, it is so broken over the, the circumstances in your life that, that I have allowed for you, my child. I know when your bills are due. I know your job is hanging by a thread. I know how to protect your children when you're not around. I know how to deepen your love for your spouse when it seems like you've lost it all. Take heart, my child. I've got you. I've got you. There is no need to worry or to be afraid. You are worth so much more than any other part of my creation. Look what I did here. Look what I did there. Look what I did. But you are my treasure. You are my prize. I've got you. I'll take care of your every need. If you'll seek me, if you will trust me, if you will just rest in me, hold lightly to the things of this world. Hold lightly the things of this world that, that, that are going to threaten you, are going to bog you down, are going to get your eyes taken off of me. Those things that so easily encumber you and entangle you in this race that you're running. Fix your eyes on me. Fix your eyes on me and run with endurance the race set before you. Fix your eyes on me. I will not let you down. You're mine. Hold lightly to the things of this world. Don't cherish those things. This isn't your final home. By the way, I've gone ahead of you and I'm preparing something that is going to blow your mind. The things that you're so worried about now aren't going to mean a hill of beans when you get there. Would Jesus say hill of beans? They're his beans. It's his hill. His cattle on a thousand hills. I think it all comes back to the question again. Uh, we, we might be concerning ourselves with all the wrong things. We're, we're, we're getting so consumed with all the wrong things. Instead of being mindful of what he has said for us to do, we, we get sidetracked because I want something else more. Maybe that's it. I want that more than I want him. I want the gift more than the giver. I want the healing more than the healer. I want to make my own list and I want you to provide for my list and, 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 and Lord when you don't you know you know what's going to happen so what do I do what, what do we do and it's hearing the words of Jesus, hearing, hearing the, the, the actual words. I mean, the red letters, for goodness sake. These, these are the words of Christ. And he's saying, don't worry. Don't be afraid. I've got you. Don't follow the world like they, like they do. They're going to eagerly pursue all this stuff. But no, you trust me. You rest in me. What does it say in verse 31? But seek me. Seek his kingdom. That's what we're going for. The, the parallel passage in Matthew 6 says, seek me or seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what will he do? He'll add all the, th all the stuff that you're worried about. He'll add all those things that you so desperately need because he knows what you need. He knows when you need them. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. What happens when we do? Look at verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. What happens when we seek him first? When we seek His righteousness and seek to please Him, and we focus not on the things of this world, not on the things that grow strangely dim, but we turn our eyes on Jesus, what happens when we do? We live, we can live without fear, live in hope and without fear, for the Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. And then, and only then, will we discover what real contentment is really like. I'm going to ask you if you would, as we conclude the sermon today. I want to conclude with the application of Philippians chapter 4. So if you would, take your copies of Scripture and turn over to the right, if you would, to several books to Philippians. We're going to go through the Corinthians and the Galatians and the Ephesians and we'll get to Philippians chapter 4. Let those pages turn.
Philippians chapter 4, to give you just a 10 second context, Paul is writing this letter. He's writing from a jail cell, more than likely in chains. He's writing not knowing what's going to happen to him next. He's writing with the scars of persecution on his back, beaten with rods, flogged, um, stoned. He bears the marks of persecution in the middle of a prison. And then he says in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men, for the Lord is near. Be anxious or worry for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. If your translation says do these things, write out practice underneath it. Continue to do them and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Those last three verses are something to really ponder on, aren't they? I have learned, Paul says, I have learned, I've acquired through experience and through instruction, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. I don't have the following notes on the screen today. I just added those last night about 11.30. But the, the idea of what Paul is uh, writing here to sum up for you, the, uh, maybe the life application for us, maybe in the side note that you may have over there in your notes, or maybe you want to squeeze it in somewhere around the Philippians 4 box. But I want you to write in these words. Don't look to the screen. They won't be up there. How do we combat this worry and contentment battle? How do we continue to go in for Let's follow the example of Paul here. Number one, there is praising and praying. Write that down for number one. Praising and praying. How in the world can somebody beaten with rods and whipped and now in chains and in stone, he can now sit in a prison cell and go rejoice in the Lord always. Are you kidding me? If anybody had reason to curse God and die, it would be this one. It would be Job in the Old Testament, right? It would be those who have, who have paid with their lives for the gospel. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then in verse 6, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and petition. All right, praising and praying. What does praising and praying do? It immediately gets your mind off of your circumstances and it refocuses it back on where it should be. Lord, I don't have this. And instead of being a whiny baby about it, go to the Lord with your petition. Instead of, being, instead of being so frustrated in the area that you are in your life and you didn't get what you thought that you wanted, try refocusing all of that energy in praise to the Lord for what He's done for you and how He saved you. Thank Him for grace and mercy. And love, I promise you, <laughs> I promise you, there will be more contentment in that than there will be in the worry and trying to make things happen on your own. Praising and praying. Number two is thanking, T-H-A-N-K, and thinking, T-H-I-N-K. In the South, they kind of sound alike, right? Thanking and thinking, all right? What do we do in this thinking by prayer and petition with thanksgiving? You try to be thankful to the Lord for the things that you've got rather than the things that you don't have or the things that aren't working? There it is again. It begins to refocus and reshift the priorities or reshift the things that we're looking to to thank Him for what we have. 
and then to think on what? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, lovely, whatever has good reputation. Think on these things. Dwell on these things. There's a thinking God for what I have, or maybe even for what I don't have. And then the thinking, the, the practicing the thinking on these things. So the first is praising and praying. The second is thinking and thinking. The third is practicing excellence. Practicing the excellent. If anything, praise worthy. He says in verse 9, you've learned, you've received, you've heard, and you've seen in me. You've got all the information that you need. Now do it. Practice it. As I was trying to discern a take home for this out of this text and the Luke 12 passage. I think of really three lessons to be learned for me to share with you today. And the first is to hold lightly to the things of this world. Hold lightly, folks. You take a stranglehold, a tight grip on the things that you can't control. It's going to bring you nothing but trouble. The things that you would even deem the most important, the most valuable things. Trust Him to know what's most important. Most of the things that we fret over are temporary and meaningless in light of eternity anyway. But you can trust Him. He'll always hold up. The second the lesson to be learned from that is there is contentment for now in a land where thorns produce pain. Contentment even in the here and now, not our home yet, where thorns produce pain, where there are weaknesses and insults, distresses, persecutions, sicknesses, and difficulties. These are the words that Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians 10 when he says we can take every thought captive. I'm like, Lord, how in the world do I do that when I'm weak? Because he'll say later on in his letter, when you're weak, then I'm strong, man. My grace is sufficient for you. Don't worry about all these other things. My grace is sufficient for you. And then I go back, I can't help but go back because Exodus is still ringing loud and clear in my head on an everyday basis. Some of you have moved on gladly from that. You've been through therapy on that already. But it's still coming back to me when I think of the children of Israel and the moaning and the complaining and the worrying that they did in Israel. Or before they got to Israel, before, before they became even a nation of God, they, they stressed in the wilderness. They struggled in the wilderness. And yet every day God provided, and yet they struggled for more, and they wanted more. And yet every day God provided for their basic every need. So the last take home is this today. Gather the manna for today, and then trust Him for tomorrow. We must get that. Trust in the manna today, and trust Him for tomorrow. Hold lightly to the things of this world. There is contentment even in the here and now where, where there is pain and where there is struggle. And I know some of you have it. I know some of you have been through the ringer. You're going through some tough things right now. And man, your whole world is consumed with worry and fear about what is to come. And if I could leave you with any encouragement today, let me lovingly guide you to this last quote. And I promise this is the last thing. A quote that I read, I just finished a book by Nancy Guthrie called Even Better Than Eden. A tremendous read. I'll hold it up for you today, but I've already let somebody borrow it. She says this, if you are weak, worn out from work, worn down by criticism, weary of constant demands or disappointments, if you've come to the end of yourself, if you've been emptied of your delusions of strength, you're at just the right place to be filled with the goodness of God. You're finally fillable. You're fully dependent. There is room for the power of Christ to rest on you in such a way that it will give you the strength to be content even as you continue to live your life in the wilderness of this world. In this world you will have tribulation. You will have struggle. But be not afraid, child of God. He has overcome the world. And He will provide for your every need. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your promises, for your instruction to us. Lord, forgive us when we're so easily in one ear and out the other, and we're so, so quickly ready to concern ourselves with all the wrong things. That the things of this world are not growing strangely dim. They're beginning to be brighter and more important in our worlds because we've taken our eyes off you. Lord, fix our eyes and our focus and our priorities back heavenward. 
the hope, the living hope that we have, Lord, that you have implanted within us, the inheritance that you are storing up for us. How can we not be of good cheer? Help us to rest in you. Help us to seek you and your kingdom first. Help your righteousness to be our priority over our own way. Help us to face this battle and to wage this war between worry and contentment by finding ourselves in your word with our eyes fixed on you. That the things of this world, nothing can compare. None of the, none of the promises, none of the things that, Lord, that we would promise to enlighten us to encourage us, to fix us, to heal us. Lord, you're better. You're better than all these things. Help us to testify and to rest in that again today. To not concern ourselves with all the wrong things, but to consider you better than all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.